Marlene said, the story of Jesus feeding large crowds of people is told four, six different times in the four Gospels. Last week we heard the story from the Gospel of Mark. Today we're going to hear the version from John's Gospel. Just a, a little note, uh, kind of side note about this reading from John's Gospel. In the Gospel of John, there is no Passover meal. Uh, no last, the, the last supper that Jesus had with his disciples was not a Passover meal. This story is actually as close as John comes to having a Passover meal with Jesus in this gospel. So let's hear John's version of the story, John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy over here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. And from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. A word of God that is still speaking, thanks be to God. <clears throat> In 1960, Martin Luther King Jr. said that the 11 o'clock hour on Sunday morning is one of the most segregated hours, if not the most segregated hour in Christian America. In 2015, LifeWay Research conducted a poll of churchgoers. I would argue with their definition of churchgoers, as long as you showed up on Christmas and Easter, you counted as a regular churchgoer. So that's who they're talking to. Side note there. Um, but anyway, in their research, they indicated that for the most part, that is still the case. It is still Sunday morning, the most segregated time in Christian America. And for the most part, we are okay with it. Ed Stetzer, the executive director of LifeWay, summed up the research in this sentence. People like the idea of diversity, they just don't like being around different people. And he went on to say, maybe their sense is that church is the space where they don't have to worry about issues like this, but that could be a problem because if you don't like diversity, you're really not going to like heaven. 82% of those interviewed said diversity is good for the country, but not necessarily in their church pews. As a church that values diversity and that celebrates the uniqueness of each individual created in the image of God, it saddens me to hear those numbers. I would like to think we, meaning the collective Christian world, would do better than that. I understand it. We like to be with people who are like us, whoever us are, because it's easy. We speak the same language, we share the same background, we might have the same beliefs or politics or history. It's just sometimes nice to be around people who just are like you, where you just, you don't have to try. Because it takes work to learn somebody else's language. It takes work to be sensitive to somebody else's culture that may be very different from yours. And it takes work to understand the differences between us and create a community together 
in spite of those differences. And I think if we're honest, sometimes we just don't want to make the effort. We are tired. And so on Sunday mornings, we gather with people like us. And yet, when all we hang out with are people like us, our world becomes very small. So what does this have to do with Jesus' story, the feeding of the 5,000? I'd probably be thinking that if I were you. Well, usually with this story, we, we get stuck on the miracle. How did Jesus take those five small loaves and two small fish and create enough food to feed over 5,000 people? Did he magically multiply them? Or was the true miracle, and I'm sure you've heard this, is the true miracle that everybody shared what they brought? We're actually going to come back to those questions. But what caught my attention first in this reading of the story is a very minor detail that John threw in almost as an afterthought. He said, there was a great deal of grass in the place. A great deal of grass. Seems like a rather unusual thing for John to throw in, unless John was just trying to make the point that there was over 5,000 people and there was plenty of space for all of them to sit down. That could be his point. A great deal of grass, room for a large crowd. But I think that he was after something different. Because if you read some of the other versions of the story, when Jesus tells people to sit down, he has them sit down in groups, groups of 50, groups of 100. And so you don't need a great deal of grass in one place. There might be patches of grass in different places that they would sit down. But Jesus has them sit down together. He does not tell them to divide up. He has them sit together because they are one people. They are one community in that moment with all of their uniqueness and diversity. We forget sometimes that a huge part of Jesus' ministry was around breaking down those barriers that divide us and bringing people together, widening that circle until everybody's inside and nobody is outside. You might have caught about what Jesus said about collecting the leftovers so that none may be lost, so that there is space and enough for everyone. We see Jesus doing this in his choice of disciples, his inner group there. Listen to how the Gospel of Matthew names those closest to Jesus. Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. Now, other than Judas, the only two in that list who are given to scriptures other than family connections is Matthew, the tax collector, and Simon the Zealot. Now, little side note, if you look in your Bibles, it might say Simon the, Can the Cananean. Zealots were a political group. They advocated not paying, actually they more than advocated not paying taxes to Rome. They would actually uh, try to stir up people into armed rebellion against Rome around this issue of taxes. In Jesus' day, they really weren't a formed group, but they were well established by the time Matthew came along. So some some of our Bibles will say Simon the Cananean as opposed to Zealot. But let me tell you what happened when Jesus was a child in Galilee. There was a guy named Judas of Galilee, and he was one of the founders of the Zealot movement. And he would burn houses of people who paid taxes, he would plunder their property, and he would kill tax collectors. And you can bet Jesus and everybody else remembered that when Jesus was an adult. And who does Jesus invite into his inner circle? Matthew the tax collector and Simon the zealot. Jesus was in the business of bringing people together. 
in spite of or maybe even because of their differences. So when it came time to meet the challenge of thousands of hungry people, Jesus did not have them divide up into groups because I think we all know what happens when we're told to divide up into groups. We find our own kind. Jesus had everybody sit together, zealot and tax collector. If we were to rewrite this story today, just imagine your extreme, and I mean extreme right, mega Christian, and your extreme left, progressive Christian, and have them sit down next to each other on a plot of grass. That's what Jesus was doing. In some ancient Near Eastern Bedouin communities, this is still true today, if an enemy joins you for a meal, they are treated as a friend, with all in the honor and respect that that entails. Imagine how relationships can change if you view your enemy as a friend and you share a meal together. You do what friends do. You talk with each other. You get to know each other. Bonds are forged. A community is created. Several years ago, we invited Mark Actemeyer here to speak. Mark is a retired theology professor and author of the book, The Bible's Yes to Same-Sex Marriage, and the next part of the title is the important part, An Evangelical's Change of Heart. Mark was behind the original efforts to successfully ban the ordination of homosexuals in the Presbyterian Church, and he was behind the successful effort to, uh, to remove that ban from the Presbyterian Church. What happened? Well, he was asked to be part of a denominational task force to work together on figuring out how to stop our church from splitting over this issue. So he found himself in this task force with people who thought very differently than he did on this subject. And they met together over the course of several years. They ate meals together. They talked together. They became a community that truly cared about each other. And they came to appreciate and learn from their differences. And minds were changed. There's an intimacy that comes from eating together. Symbolically, yet you can't pick up you know, your, your meat if you got a sword in your hand. So you got to put down your weapons, you got to put down your defenses in order to pick up your food and eat. And so if everybody is putting down their weapons and their defenses, space is created for understanding and for caring and for community to grow. Now remember I said I'd get back to the question of the miracle. Well, First, I think it's unlikely that the only person in those 5,000 people gathered to have food was one little boy. So, I do think that as they sat down to see what Jesus would do next, as they saw Jesus take that meager offering and give thanks and start sharing it, I think, and I know a lot of others do too, I think others started pulling out their meals and sharing it with those around them. We ended up with one big picnic, potluck picnic there on the grass. But think about what that means. Jesus set the table. He he created the space, and He issued the invitation, but the people were the ones who created the community together. They created it by being willing to sit down with each other, by being willing to share what they brought, young and old, rich and poor, farmer and artisan, Jew and Roman, tax collector and zealot. Jesus invited, but they had to make the choice about whether they were going to accept that invitation and sit down and share a meal with those around them. I know I am not the only one who looks at our world and the divisions we have and wonder what the future will hold. I long for the day where what happened on that mountainside would happen everywhere. I long for the day when, as a prophet Isaiah said, swords will be beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. Notice weapons of war being transformed into implements to feed the world. There's a theme there. 
I hunger for a world where we can celebrate our differences and not be threatened by them, where we can come together in spite of our differences or with our differences and our different ideas and opinions and beliefs with the goal of learning from each other, seeking to understand each other rather than defending our point of view. I hunger for that world where we can sit down on that large grassy mountainside and share a meal together with no other agenda than to eat and enjoy each other's company, no matter who we are, no matter what us we belong to. I have a feeling I'm not the only one who hungers for that. Your hunger may not be quite as, as expansive either. It may be a little closer to home as many of us have broken relationships and in families or with those we at one time called friends. I know starting in 2016, I've heard so many people say, I thought we were friends and I discovered we weren't. What happens if we invite them over for a meal? Maybe we find ourselves with people whose culture we don't fully understand. And we may not even realize we don't fully understand their culture. I started talking about diversity and how we say we want it, but when it comes right down to it, we frequently default to hanging around with people like us. Well, I'm looking around here, and I'm guessing for those online, most of us have the experience of being in the majority, wherever we are. Imagine what it's like if you were in the minority all the time. Some of you don't have to imagine that. You know what that's like. When those of us in the majority don't take the time and the effort to learn about people who are not like us, the consequences can be deadly. We saw that in the news story about the shooting of Sonia Massey in her home. She had called them asking for help. They came, and of course, we don't know what happened before the video, but she ended up saying, they ended up saying to her, put down the pot or we'll shoot, and she ended up saying, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Now, I will have a confession to make. When I saw that video, I did think the police escalated things to a level that was not warranted. But when I heard her say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, my first thought was, boy, that's making it worse. Why did you say that? Do you have a mental health issue? That is honestly the very first thing that instinctively went through my head. And I'm sorry to say that's what went through my head. Because I have since learned, and I will share this with you in case you did not know this, to say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus is a very common way in the African-American community of saying, God forbid, or don't do that, or don't let that happen. Does that change your thought of Sonia Macy? I am very grateful for my friends in the African-American community who took the time to explain that to me, because I did not know. And they have multiple times over the years helped me understand the uniqueness of their culture, and they have been gracious to me when I don't understand or when I make assumptions without really knowing what I'm talking about. But that's what it means to come together as one people in a community. It becomes a safe place, even with our differences, where we can talk about difficult things, where we can learn from each other, and where we can grow and support each other. I wonder if Jesus had some of that in mind when he invited everybody to sit down as one. In spite of how divided our nation is, or maybe because of it, I think most of us hunger for that kind of community. But again, here's the thing. Jesus can only set the table and issue the invitation and it's a big table. There is room for everybody. But we're the ones who make the community by our choices. Whether we choose to put down our weapons and let down our defenses or whether we, we hold them at the ready. Whether we choose to share what we have or not. Whether we choose to ask curious questions or not. 
you know, what don't you understand about that person or their beliefs or their culture or their faith, their life, their hobbies, their work? What do you have in common? Most of us have more in common than what divides us, but it's what divides us that gets all of the energy and attention. I have grown from getting to know and understand people different from myself. My life is richer for that, and I hope theirs are too. The more we share of ourselves and the more we, we receive the gift of the others sharing, the richer our whole community is. So my charge to you is a little early than the benediction at the end of the service. My charge to you now is don't default to hanging out with people like you. Find that nice plot of grass and invite someone over you don't know or who you know thinks differently from you or who comes from a culture different than yours. Invite them over for a feast. And maybe in the spirit of what Jesus did that day on the mountainside, invite them to bring their favorite dish with them and to share what it means to them. And you make your favorite dish too and share what it means to you. Ask curious questions. Explore those areas where you think or believe differently. What can you learn about each other? What can you learn from each other? What can you celebrate about them? What can you share of yourself with them? That's how community is made. Amen.